All right, so this is the second video for chapter seven, and in it we're going to make sure that we understand the structure of how, in general, energy problems work, but we do have a full set of full example problems that are also going to be available to us, and those are um, part of the overall um, lecture content. If we were in class, we would see some introductory stuff like I'm going to have in this video, and then we would be doing example problems on the board, and those are just separate videos for each example so that we can fit them in where we have time. So the big idea is that we have learned about this idea of work in the first video, that work is a way for us to transfer energy to or from a system. But the point is, if we have this ability to transfer energy to or from a system, what can we do with that? What can we actually do with work? If we imagine having an object and we imagine pushing on that object, we can get that object to move. If we speed up an object from rest, we are giving that object energy and now it has motion. We will post in a um, handout, a, a vir virtual digital handout, a PDF, uh, the derivation of the tools that we're about to introduce in the next couple of slides. But the key part is we can actually use our understanding from chapter two and from chapter four to figure out how applying a force to a block and figuring out that acceleration and then knowing that if we're accelerating something a distance d, it only has so much time to speed up to a final value for the um, speed or velocity. And after we look at that derivation, what we'll learn is that once an object is moving, because we gave it energy through a force, that amount of energy the object now has is equal to what we call kinetic energy, and it's equal to one half times the mass times the speed of the object squared. So the derivation of that is on a handout that you should look at and make sure you understand. The key thing that we show where this equation comes from is because it is actually using physics that we have already been talking about. The idea of forces and Newton's second law, F equals MA, the net force equals mass times acceleration, and our understanding from chapter two with kinematics when we actually use the um, position uh, velocity equation, the Vx equation, to figure out how how much energy we have with those ideas. So we'll be seeing that term show up in our energy problems, but we just want to make sure we understand as long as an object is moving, it has kinetic energy. The other thing we can do is if we lift an object up, it now contains energy. Because the key thing is that it has energy that can be released if we just drop the object. So by pulling the object up a certain distance um, that we could call a distance d, but because it's um, up and down, we're going to call it height, and we're going to use the letter h just so we can really easily distinguish that height is up and down, then the amount of work that we did is based on how much we moved it um, higher. So if an object is higher, it has energy, and that term is going to be called gravitational potential energy, and we will also have on that um, handout a way that we can understand using our understanding of chapter four, the force of gravity, and our understanding of work from the previous section, how we get this term, that the potential energy of gravity is equal to mass times the acceleration of gravity, g, times the height h, mgh. So we're going to be seeing how this term is also used in problem solving. But if an object is higher up than it is able to be, it contains gravitational potential energy that can be released um, back uh, into the object or turned into something else. The key idea and these will not be the only two types of energy that we have, but for the first half of the chapter, they're, they're going to be the ones that we're working with. We can follow work and energy around in a problem and account for where it goes, much like we would money in an accounting problem. If we're trying to figure out a budget, we figure out how much money we have at the start of the month. 
we figure out if we are um, gaining money. For example, if we have a job and we have income, if we're spending money, if we go out and buy things that we need. And then at the very end of all of that, we see how much money we have left at the end of the month. It's the same kind of work, uh, the same kind of um, situation for a work energy problem, where the energy at the start of the problem is in either kinetic energy or potential energy. We can kind of think of it as uh, energy in the bank or energy in our wallets, uh, money in, our, in the bank or money in, the wall, in our wallets, where there could be several places where it is, but we still count up how much we have. Then the work added term, if we are gaining new energy, that's like the income, we can have more at the end, but we could also be losing energy. If we have friction in a problem, it will be taking energy away. We're losing that energy. It could be a negative term, but we still account for it on that particular work added term. And then we figure out where that energy is at the end of the problem. Do we have more in the bank because we deposited it? Do we have more in our wallets because we um, withdrew it? That energy can be shifted around to different terms, even if we still have the same amount at the end of the problem as we did at the beginning. And so we'll see those examples over and over in full example problems. We'll also see a couple of smaller examples today. Now, if a force moves an object just forward along its path, speeds it up or slows it down, slows it down, that's accounting for kinetic energy. We can give that object kinetic energy by speeding it up. We can take um, kinetic energy by slowing an object down, by basically pushing against the motion. And the force of gravity that pulls all objects constantly downwards, that is also accounted for by gravitational potential energy. The key statement for that is that when we are thinking about all of the possible places where we can have a work added term, we're thinking back to our previous lecture, the work added term is the force in the direction of motion times distance. The force of gravity is not one that we have to worry about because it is already being dealt with for any given problem in that gravitational potential energy term. So instead, all we are looking for is an additional push or pull an additional um, force of friction or force of air resistance. When we see those kinds of things in the problem, then we know that we have to have a work added term. All right. So we have this other statement in the textbook that we are actually going to talk about a little bit more in the next lecture video, not this one. The idea of what's called non-conservative forces, friction and air resistance, those are forces that are not able to have their own energy term. We just have to find them and use them in a standard, regular work uh, term, work added term. So we will always have a separate term for work when we have non-conservative forces. Friction, air resistance, an additional push, an additional pull. In this entire course, the way that we think about this energy balance is energy at the beginning of the problem. So energy in the system before the problem started, plus work added to the system. And that work added term can be positive or negative. And then after we do that, we find at the end energy in the system after. Energy when the problem is finished, what, what kind of energy do we have and where is it? So this slide here has all of the tools for Chapter 7 that we have talked about so far. The top one, the work being force in the direction of motion times distance. That's from our previous um, lecture video. Then kinetic energy being one half mass times uh, speed squared. And the potential energy from gravity being mass times g times the height h. Those two as I noted before, there is going to be a handout on our um, Blackboard site that will make sure we understand where those terms came from, but we will have those um, given to us on any equation sheet for quizzes or tests. And then at the bottom here in big, um, in big bold uh, font here is the key problem-solving tool that we will see over and over in energy problems. 
that we look at the energy before, we discuss the work added, and it could be positive or negative work added, and then we have energy after. The book does a couple of things differently, and so before we talk about the example problems that we're going to do, I just want to make sure that we understand the small differences. So the textbook makes it look a lot more complicated than it is. It has kinetic energy initial, potential energy initial, work of non-conservative forces, and then kinetic energy final, potential energy final. And the book introduces this idea of mechanical energy as being some separate thing to worry about, which is all of the kinetic and potential energies together. That means not heat or electrical energy, other forms of energy that exist in the world. The nice thing is for Physics 125, we really don't have to worry about mechanical energy as opposed to something else because we're only going to talk about things that are either kinetic energy terms, and in Chapter 10 we'll get a new one, or potential energy terms. And by the end of this chapter, we'll have two different types of potential energy. So if we were to take Physics 125 and 126, we would learn about different types of energy as well. So electrical energy, chemical energy, things like that. But we don't have to worry about that for our course. The first two in this set, though, springs, is from this chapter, and rotation is from an upcoming chapter. Those are ones that we'll talk about in Physics 125, just not in this lecture section. Okay, so we will have separate videos that do full examples, top to bottom, plug in all of the numbers and get final answers. For this lecture video, I just want to make sure that we understand how the overall flow of these problems is going to look so that we know what to do when we get to those example problems. And we'll still see them done start to finish for us, but this is just going to be a setup. We will not get the numbers plugged in for this lecture video because then it would go on a little bit too long and we have those other examples to look at. Okay, so we've got all of our tools on the slide here and we have um, some information given to us. So we have that there is a two kilogram cart at the top of a ramp, and it's gonna slide down a frictionless incline, we won't have to worry about friction, that is six meters long. And it's gonna drop vertically three meters um, from the top of the ramp to the bottom of the ramp. So our goal is to find the speed of the mass at the bottom of the incline. All right, so off camera I'm gonna do this and then I'll show us. But the first thing that we always want to do in a problem is draw a picture. So in your notes, while I'm drawing it, you can also draw it. We want to basically copy in all of the information that's given to us on the slide. So we have the block at the top that is not moving. And by the bottom of it, which is a difference of six meters along the um, track, it is going to be moving with the final speed, okay? Now, so far, we have this picture, okay? We'll come back to it, but you can always go back and pause it. And the key thing with the pictures that we're going to draw is we are going to identify what we mean by before. So at the top of the ramp is before, and we're going to identify what we mean by after. In these problems because that will allow us to ask some quick que quick questions so um, when we look at the different types of energy that we have so far we have kinetic energy if an object is moving it has kinetic energy and we have potential energy from gravity if an object is higher than it is at other points in the problem it has potential energy from gravity so at the beginning of the problem, the block is not moving. At the end of the problem, it is moving. So it has kinetic energy at the end of the problem. It does not have any kinetic energy at the start of the problem. And at the beginning of the problem, the block is higher than it will be at other points. And at the end of the problem, it is not. And so what we can do is we can make this little, um, this little chart here of kinetic energy and potential energy from gravity, and whether we have it, and then we write in the term, or whether we don't, and then we don't write in the term, we write a zero instead. 
that is a way for us to be able to keep track of the situation in a way that's easy to look at. And the full example problems that we're going to post will show you, I'm kind of doing it off screen, they'll show you what we're going through and go a little bit clearer through that. And then the other term or thing that we have to think about is whether there is a work term. Now, if we think about this cart, nobody is pushing or pulling on it. We don't have to worry about friction. And so the only forces, if we were thinking about this as a chapter four problem, the only forces here are gravity and the normal force. Now, gravity is already accounted for by the potential energy from gravity term. Even the fact that it's straight down and not um, directly along the um, ramp, all of that is dealt with. We don't have to go into more detail there. And then the normal force, if we think about the normal force, it is perpendicular to the surface, and yet we are going along parallel to the surface. And so the angle between where the normal force points and where the motion is, is a 90 degree angle which means that we can't have a work term because the cosine of 90 degrees is zero. There is no piece of the force in the direction of motion. That value is, is zero for the work term. And so the way that we would set this up is we would take all of the different terms from our system here that are the before column. And if we had work, we would write out work. And if we don't, we uh, would write zero. And we basically get our energy before plus work added equals energy after. So I'm going to write that out. Energy before plus work added equals energy after. And so I've written I've written out the um, terms and more specifically, let me get this in view. More specifically, I have written out that we have gravity, potential energy from gravity at the beginning, and we have kinetic energy at the end, and we could start to plug in numbers. So a two kilogram cart, the height here is three meters and so on. So I will go one step further and write the numbers in, and then you can kind of confirm for yourself that um, they work out the way they do. Um, even though I'm gonna do it off screen, you can make sure that that makes sense to you. And as always, um, there's gonna be those example problems to be able to look at um, as well. And so what we will get is that when we plug in the numbers, we get a speed of 7.67 meters per second. Okay. I'm hoping that's in view. So we will do full examples where we see it in front of us going on. This one's a smaller example. And so um, once you go back and see those fully worked examples, you can come back and try these again on your own and see if it makes sense to you that we get 7.67 meters per second. But the key thing here is that we could have done this problem back in chapter four. It would have been difficult for us, but not impossible. We would have had to find the net force acting down the ramp. That would have been the component of gravity pointing along the ramp. And then that would have given us the net acceleration. So net force equals mass times acceleration. We've gotten the acceleration. Then we could have plugged it into a chapter two kinematics equation where we have no initial kinetic or no initial velocity. We have this certain acceleration acting over a six meter long distance, and we would be able to calculate that final velocity. 
and we would still get the 7.67. If you've got time and you really want to convince yourself of it, we could actually um, try that on our own and get that same number value at the end. The key thing about energy, though, is it is able to let us do problems that we would not otherwise have been able to do. So let's look at this example here. We have a two kilogram block that swings on a four meter long rope. It starts from rest at a height of three meters above the bottommost point, And our goal is to find the speed of the mass at the bottom of the swing. Now let's think about this example here. Although it kind of looks like a chapter six problem, we don't have a way from chapter six to deal with a changing speed. All of the examples that we did in chapter six, we were either, either given the speed that it was currently acting at, and then we answer questions about that situation, or it's moving around at a constant speed in a circle around and around, and then we can answer questions about that too. This problem is not solvable with physics 125 equations, it would require calculus to be able to hand, handle the changing direction as the block moves around. If we look at all of the forces acting on this system, there is only gravity, which already has the gravitational potential energy term, and there is tension. But tension is pointing towards the center of the circle at all points along the motion, and the speed that whole time along the um, circle, the motion is perpendicular or tangent to the circle. And so at all points, we have the tension pointing towards the center and the motion pointing uh, tangent to it. And we get that 90 degree angle again. There's no work term that comes from the force of tension. So if we draw the picture, and we can draw the situation uh, on our page, we have the after, where we have a speed V, and we have a before where we aren't moving at all, but we are a height difference of three meters above our final location. So before we are higher, but we are not moving. And after, we are moving, but we are not higher. If we look at this situation, what we will learn, or hopefully notice, as soon as we've set the whole thing up, is that even with this totally different looking situation from the previous one, we still end up with only potential energy at the beginning and only kinetic energy at the end. And with a height difference of three meters and a mass the same, we end up with exactly the same speed. So although we have two very different looking problems, the previous one is a block sliding down a ramp, solvable with chapter four, but complicated, and a block swinging on a rope in a circle, not solvable with our chapter, um, with our physics 125 tools, but solvable here in chapter seven, they end up with the same number value because the process of solving this is the same. We look at what energy we have at the beginning, we look at what energy we have at the end, and we figure out if there's any work added or subtracted. Now, these two example problems work the same. The first one is solvable, the second one is not. But what it does show us is that the overall structure of these energy problems are very similar from one example to the next, and they can be very, very powerful to answer this subset of situations where we can track all of the energy. So these examples that are on the next couple of slides and uh, on the next couple of posted um, slides, they each have their own full video, 10 to 15 minutes, going through and explaining from the very beginning to the very end how to solve these. So this first example, it almost looks like a chapter two problem when we first glance at it, and we'll learn that we can answer questions um, from uh, 
from the energy technique that aren't solvable using our understanding of chapter two or our understanding of um, chapter four forces. This second problem, it looks like a, um, a projectile motion problem, and it is completely solvable using chapter three projectile motion, but it would be really complicated and kind of long, and we'll see that it is pretty straightforward. It's the same structure as all of the other energy problems. The third example that has its own video, we glance at it and we see forces at angles, we're having flashbacks to chapter four and five, and we'll see that we can also answer it using exactly the same setup, the same process, and we get um, the speed at the top very quickly, when this otherwise would have been a very complicated chapter four plus chapter two situation. A quick note that when I did the example video, which I did first, I had the wrong angle in the 19.5, it said 18.4 instead. Um, that number is not even used in the example, so the video itself is not wrong. I just want us, if we're looking back and forth between the videos, to note that. The fourth example, again, each one of these has its own full video to look at. The fourth example kind of looks like chapter six, but it is a situation that we would not have been able to solve in chapter six. A changing speed as we go around in circles is beyond our current understanding, although we will talk about it in chapter 10. And then the last example that we have before we had a new type of energy is one where we recognize that we're actually able to do a lot more than what we necessarily think at the beginning. So it's not just tracking the energy of one object, but if we have two objects tied together the way that we did in chapters four and five, we can actually follow the system and the energy in the entire system by looking at what kinds of energy each object has. So keep in mind that the process is still gonna be the same. We're still looking at the energy budget, this equation at the bottom for the entire system. But when we try to figure out what kinds of energy we have, we ask about each of the objects separately. So the system that we're gonna be looking at in our fifth example problem, um, it will be its own video, is called an Atwood machine. And so I wanna talk about it briefly before we see a video about it because I do want us to think about what is going to happen so we have a better understanding of what to do next when we, um, when we do the example. So the first thing I want us to think about is the two questions here on the slide. These are questions that I want us to answer conceptually to see if we understand the situation. There's no plugging in numbers anywhere at, um, at this point. I just want us to think about this. So if you wanna take a moment and think about these two questions on the slide, just pause the video here and then we'll go through the answers together. Okay, so hopefully you have thought about them and you're not just waiting for me to tell you the answer because that's not a good check to see if things are making sense to us or not. But if we let go of this system, we have the bigger mass object currently in the air, the lower mass objects on the ground, when we let go of the system, the heavier object will move downwards and the lighter object will move upwards because they're connected by a rope. They will move in exactly the same way as that happens. And so we expect that whole system to kind of rotate. The heavy mass will drop, the lighter mass will be pulled upwards as that happens. At the moment though, at the very beginning of the problem, we might recognize that what we have at the moment is not kinetic energy at all. Nothing is currently moving. And the only potential energy that we have is from the 10 kilogram block, not from both blocks. So we have one term for the energy before, and it's the, the potential energy of gravity for the 10 kilogram block. We'll see how that fits into the overall problem. This picture here has the before and the after and this is solved fully um, in a separate video, just like the others. So this is where we um, are gonna cut off this particular lecture video. This is not the end of the chapter seven toolkit, and it's not even the end of the energy balance problems, because there's an additional place where we can easily store work that we can talk about, where we have to introduce springs that are from the textbook chapter five 
but this is really the only place where we care too much about them, and um, so we're going to introduce them from scratch. That will take place, however, in the next video. So I will see you then.